So we'll just start with the uh, 5,000. Uh, after these things, Yeshua went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee or Tiberias. A large crowd followed him because they saw the signs which he was performing on those who were sick. And Yeshua went up on the mountain, and the, there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was near. Therefore Yeshua, lifting up his eyes and seeing that a large crowd was coming to him, said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these may eat? This he was saying to test him, for he himself knew what he was intending to do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, for everyone receive, to receive a little. And one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, Well, there's a lad here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are these for so many people? Yeshua said, Have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. Yeshua then took the loaves, having given thanks, he distributed to those who were seated, likewise also of the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments so that nothing will be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the barley loaves, which were left over by those who had eaten. Therefore, when the people saw the sign which he had performed, they said, this truly is the prophet who has come into the world. So Yeshua, perceiving that they were intending to come and take him by force and make him king, withdrew into the mountain himself alone. So, what's the big difference from between us and the rest of the world? We keep the holy days of the Bible. And what happens when we get close to Passover in our houses? We have thrown away all the bread. Okay, okay, we've eaten it up, we've stopped buying it, we've stopped baking it, because we are removing the leaven from our house. So that's why that's there. Because Passover was there, the land didn't have bread. So they're like, we can't buy these guys bread. Does it exist? 200 denarii is not going to give us any, uh, any food. The five barley loaves. You know, we think of a loaf today as, um, uh, you know, when you go to the store, where you buy a loaf, they're actually more like five pitas. It's more like a, more like a loaf, like a, like a biscuit, like a muffin. And so, uh, so they have very, very marginal food and barley loaves, which I have learned this week are um, low class food. Like the, they were for uh, barley was for the masses and the higher ups would have the wheat. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, today, if you found a barley loaf somewhere, you'd be like, wow, right? Because everything's wheat today. So we're totally blessed with that. Um, so um, it, it actually says that the Passover was near. Uh, they may have been winding things down, but yeah, um, I don't know that they would have been totally bereft of, you know, um, yeah. Leavened bread at that point in time. Yeah, but there certainly wouldn't be like a normal day in summertime, right? Where 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 the they they would have you know all kinds of stuff in the stores and stuff. That's my that's what I'm getting at. Yeah, they're probably not totally out, but they're also probably not willing to give up what they have. <laughs> okay. okay, so um, in verse eleven, it says he gave thanks. What's different between us and the rest of the world? He said, Baruch Atah Yahweh Eloheinu Melech HaOlam of Hamotzi Lechem Min Haaretz. That's how they say thanks, right? Thank you, God, for giving us bread from the earth, right? <laughs> Is what that means. So he gave thanks. He gave thanks to somebody that wasn't him. That's a shocker, right? Hey, Jaden, why did you guys go play in the other room, huh? Yeah, yeah. Mm. <laughs> there you go. So, um, so that was interesting. And now the rest of it, right? What does anybody have any significance on these numbers here? Five thousand people, five loaves, twelve baskets left over. Now I got nothing either. 
I didn't tell you. No, it was yeah, I did set that up like I was gonna tell you, didn't I? Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Uh no, I've looked at the um I've stared at this, I've looked at commentaries, I went to First Fruits of Zion. I'm like, surely somebody has tied that together. And there isn't really a correlation. Now the story is explained later. Right later in the chapter, we get the answer as to why, but as far as right now, um, it just seems like it's just a straightforward miracle, right? Everett, Ross, and Marie. Yeah, I've I've heard people explain various things, but I really don't remember <laughs> what the, what they had to say about it. Uh, usually, or, or it's not unusual for. <laughs> numbers to have significance you're absolutely right but uh i'm not very creative in that area you know it, it's got to come out and tell me what it means right 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 for sure so the uh you know i just never had any significance to it it just looks like they had a miraculous feeding with 12 baskets left over now the 12 baskets left over now we go, wait a minute, there's 12 disciples, right? There's 12 tribes, 13, right? You know, 12 and a hook, right? Because <laughs> Levi doesn't often get counted because there's two for Joseph. But there's, you know, so the 12 left over, that, that's pretty easy to associate with something. Uh, but there's, again, there's nothing clear. You got anything? Andy? Andy? No? no? You just listen? All right. All right. So the... Sometimes we do just have to look at these verses and go, they just say what they say, right? <laughs> There's no hidden meaning. There's no nothing. Because it, it, here in a couple of verses, he's actually going to explain why this happened. And it's pretty profound and also very straightforward. <laughs> very, very straightforward. So anybody else on this part before we scoot on? Uh, it it seems interesting to me that uh, he went with his disciples up this mountain, and somewhere out of nowhere, five thousand guys descended upon him. You know, the word must have gotten around uh, somehow or another pretty easily for for that kind of a crowd, uh, without advertising. You know, to uh, <laughs> show up at this place right um be, it says because they saw the signs he was performing on those who were sick so they're they're following right. him around now kind of this i'm kind of getting ahead of myself but kind of like a carnival act kind of like well, what's he going to do next right mm -hmm. so he's he the but the signs are getting people to pay attention to him and then what does he do he's teach he uses the opportunity to teach Right. He gets the huge crowd together with the miracles and then he get, teaches them the word accurately, which, of course, the Jews not happy about. They would prefer they be locked up in synagogue hearing them teach, not yeah. him. Right. Yeah. In, the, in the wild. Yeah. But, yeah, you're right, though. That is a lot of people. And I've always wondered about the amphitheater, too. Like, how can 5000 people hear somebody who without you know, the gadgetry that we have today, you know, because it just doesn't, you know, was he at an amphitheater? Did I miss that? No, he says on the side of the ocean in a field with lots of grass. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, in Revelation, it does say the people are like grass, a couple places in the Bible, which just means that there's so many people and we're fragile. So there might be a correlation there. Was it just men there, you think? I, I wouldn't think so. Women and children. Yeah, yeah. In, in verse 10, it, it says, uh, make the people sit down. But then later it says, so the men sat down. Does that mean the women didn't? You know, I mean, it's just, it's it's not being clear on that area one way or another, it seems. Yeah. So in, um, come here, a man, fellow man. So, you know, in, uh, we don't have this in English. We used to have it a little bit in English. We don't have a lot of gender built in. But in other languages, if you have a group of women, it's a group of women. If you have a group of women with one man, it becomes a group of men. And I think that's probably what's happening here. Um, like when it says in, in the Tanakh, 
it says that, uh, you know, all the men, like a commandment that all the men are supposed to do something. Sometimes it's all the men, but sometimes it's all the actual, uh, you know, all of Israel. Yeah. But I, I, <clears throat> I can't imagine there being that many people and not having, you know, children and women present at the same time. Well, there's um, obviously a little boy there. Yeah. There you go. Right. And, and it would be astonishingly chauvinistic if the women weren't allowed to sit down. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, yeah, right. no, no, not you. Not you, Elizabeth, Mary. No, uh-uh. Right, <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Well, it, it could also be as well that uh, Yeshua was a little more loose with his uh, male-female relationships, I think, because he was talking to the woman at the well and the disciples didn't understand why he would do such a thing, you know, yeah. where he is the one that says, have the people sit down. Right. But John evidently wrote, well, the men sat down, you know, so maybe there's still a little bit of that going on. It could be uh, because that is a, a cultural uh, thing that he would, he would talk to a woman. I hope, I mean, they got over that because uh, later, later letters, it does have, you know, both genders having offices and doing stuff. We're not, we're not, we're not going to go with the whole Methodist thing here and right, right, <laughs> putting women in charge of the church. But we do have prophetesses. We do have ladies uh, work miracles. Um, charity. What was Dorcas? Dorcas is a female, right? Yeah, yeah. It was a, a charity. Teach the other women and children. Yeah, they teach other women and children. Yep. Priscilla so. and Aquila. Yeah, one of those is female. Yeah. Yeah. Probably Priscilla. Priscilla, yeah. <laughs> so now we get to the walking on the water. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, and after getting into a boat, they started to cross the sea to Capernaum. It had already become dark, and Yeshua had not yet come to them. The sea began to be stirred up because a strong wind was blowing. Then, when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Yeshua walking on the sea and drawing near to the boat. And they were frightened, but he says, it's not, I be, don't be afraid, but they, so they were willing to receive him into the boat. And immediately the boat was at land in which they were going. You know, what's significant about John's version and Mark's version. Doesn't mention Peter. Doesn't mention Peter. Yeah. Peter's omitted. Peter getting out of the boat is not there. That's seems as like a significant event to leave out. Right. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, that's a miracle right there. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, he's really racking up the miracles right here because, you know, feeding 5,000 people out of thin air. And then, and some people try to explain that away to say that the 5,000 people had squirreled away food and it was just a generosity type event. But I don't believe that. I don't, I don't, I think as we move on, we're going to see that that wasn't the case either. Um, but he's he, walking on the water. Well, if he created the water, he could probably walk on the water. Right. <laughs> right. And so he's, you know, he's out there trekking along, walking across the ocean, three miles, they've rowed three miles and he catches up to them. Right. So they're rowing against the headwind. Maybe he brought the headwind on. So he could catch them. Right? That's something to think about. And he's just, can you just imagine him walking along? Boop -a -doop. Oh, hey, what's up, fellas? Right? <laughs> he's walking on the water. That's amazing. And uh, and then the second he gets in the boat, they're at the land. So the, the whole time that he was alive, he had powers and abilities that he was restrained or restrained himself from using. He clearly could teleport, right? He could walk on the water and he could have just bebopped them across that lake at any at any given time. And they call it a sea. I don't think it's a sea, right? To us, a sea is Mediterranean, Atlantic, Pacific. This is a big lake, right? You know, which we have Smithville Lake is called a lake and it's several miles long. It's huge. So um, he says, don't be afraid. Like, what do you mean, don't be afraid? There's a guy walking on the water, right? <laughs> right? That's that's alarming, right? Maybe 
maybe not that alarming. What do you say, April? Well, I, I see that they were in a dark place and a tempest had come, a very hard storm and struggle in their life was there. And Yeshua comes walking on the water like he is going to, he's their answer. He is the one that if you just trust him, faith and he comes into your life or their lives and that big bad storm was gone he said don't be afraid yeah. um, I just, I, similarities in this in, in the story all right that's good and we've been out canoeing on smithville lake with a headwind before and we got in this canoe four of us in a big silver canoe and we were rowing and rowing and rowing and we were like 15 minutes we were digging into this water pretty hard and went nowhere we stopped for a second turn around we had literally gone nowhere and so so that was rather disheartening but that's what these fellows are doing right there is that they're they're trying to row and the wind is not letting them go um which is interesting that it seems that they were prevented um, it, it seems to me as well, <laughs> for what it's worth, um, that if he could walk on the water, he could have skied on the water. <laughs> <laughs> that would be pretty funny. Yeah, he could have skied, but not behind their boat. They weren't going anywhere, right? <laughs> he comes by like on rollerblades. Yeah, that would be fun. Wonder if he did that when nobody was looking. <laughs> you know, you gotta you gotta wonder because he's, he's it's his first miracle where Mary's like, do whatever he says. She, he could do stuff. She knew he could do stuff. So you, you gotta wonder, you know, if, yeah, if he was a kid. And she there's a funny cartoon where it shows a baby laying on top of the water and Mary going in, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> Because if he didn't want to take a bath, he wouldn't have got in the water. He could have just laid on the water. So, all right, moving along. The next day, the crowds that stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other small boat there except one, and that Yeshua had not entered with his disciples into the boat, but his disciples had gone away alone. There came out. Other small boats from Tiberias near to the place where they ate the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Yeshua was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the small boats and came to Capernaum seeking Yeshua. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Yeshua answered and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. That's the answer we're looking for. Miracles do not produce faith. They're chasing him down because they want another meal. And that's what that's what they're doing. He's calling them out. He's saying, you saw signs, but you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life which the Son of Man will give you, for on him the Father, God, has set his seal. The purpose of these miracles are to get the people's attention. Spiritual, spiritual life. And, and to say, hey, if I can do this stuff, can you imagine what else I can do? And pay attention to what I say. So they said to him, what do we do so that we may work the works of God? Yeshua answered and said to them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. Then they say, what then do you do for a sign that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? One of those opportunities. Remember, remember, he had a very patient individual, this son of God, right? Because he continued on his mission and died for these ingrateful people. 
at this moment, he they their bellies are they're not even done digesting the miraculous food. They know that he somehow miraculously got across this lake. They saw signs, and now they're like, Well, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do for us to believe in you? That's not our relationship. Our relationship is blessed are those who believe without seeing. Our relationship, 2,000 years away, is to believe that this stuff happened and not see. And that that's the faith that he's looking for. He's looking for a faith that's not validated, that's kind of raw, that's kind of unfounded. And, you know, we do a lot of searching the Bible and a lot of academic work in order to mesh things together. But we need to, there needs to be a leap of faith inside of each of us to some degree or another. Some people have it more than others. Some people are, you know, don't, don't need much of anything whatsoever. Other people spend their days, you know, dispelling every evolutionary theory to make sure that only the creation in the Bible is true. You know, but that's okay. You know, we can, we do, we can do that. But these guys who are saying we need to see a work in order to believe need to be contrasted against the Hebrews in the desert. Uh, this all reminds me of when Yeshua said uh, something like an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but none shall be given except the sign of Jonah. Um, and I always saw it as if you if you saw a miracle that was like, one where it was so obvious you, know, you were like a hundred percent sure it was god then you wouldn't have the choice of whether to believe or not like it would just be a no a no-brainer basically right and but but he gives you the choice like it like he could give you that miracle but he chooses not to because he wants you to have the choice of whether you believe or not and you know i had the shoulder problem this year right and it's back a little bit but I'll be because I was diligent when I had the pain, I had the MRI and had all this stuff, diligent to do all of my therapy. The second I could go back to throwing pallets over fences, I was done. And it's a memory. It's gone. So the miraculous healings and the healings and stuff are going to fade, even though I had to work for that healing. And it wasn't even that long ago. I was already taking it for granted. And so the. Hebrews in the wilderness saw 10 plagues that destroyed the Egyptians. They saw the pillar of fire. They saw the cloud. They saw the sea parted. They walked across the sea on dry ground. They heard the word of Yahweh from Mount Sinai. And they still wanted to go back because of cucumbers. Okay. So the miracles aren't going to produce a faith. And when you were looking for a transactional uh, relationship, that's not what this is about. So also in the end time, Satan will produce miracles. So you can't just look for signs of miracles for the father. Right. That's Deuteronomy 13, one through five, those who work miracles, but are teaching against the commandments, teaching against the Torah. So we, we, the fact that somebody could read your mind, or they could call down fire from heaven, or they could levitate, that's those are supernatural powers, but supernatural powers don't just come from Yahweh. They come from the evil one, too. And our only test is the law and the Messiah, right? <laughs> Got to be both. Yeah. Discernment. Yeah. So... So, yeah, and they come back and even say, our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them bread out of heaven to eat. That's a slam. He's reminding them, you you guys, you guys think if I, I give you, I, I'm not going to be fooled twice, right? I know that the last time I gave man, manna out of heaven, that they, that they reject, that they didn't matter. It didn't matter. They complained. They wanted quail, not Dan, the food. And uh, they want they wanted uh, uh, you know, and, and he said he made it come out of their noses, and he says, "Truly, truly, I say to you, it, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. 
For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. So the lesson from him protecting everybody in Egypt and across the desert is that the bread of life named Yeshua is coming later. It's a forecasting. And that's a very uh, hard thing for us to understand. Uh, maybe, maybe not. But in Paul writes, I think it's Paul that says, for while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, right? When the Hebrews came out of Egypt, they didn't know who they were. They didn't know the Torah. They didn't know anything. And they were saved. They were saved and they were brought out for a purpose and they were fed bread from heaven for a purpose so that they could exist and we could have this Bible and we could have all of these lessons for us to learn from today, which doesn't discount that their lives mattered in their context. A lot of times Christianity looks at the Old Testament as a, a collection of stories, right, right, that don't really matter. But it did matter. And the people who were faithful were faithful, and the people who weren't, weren't. But he's saying, the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. We know from John 1, he's the light. He gives the light of the world. We know throughout that he is very powerful. And they say, Lord, give us always this bread. And he says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. Now they're now they're about to check out. Okay. <laughs> they're about to lose it. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So here he is on earth. Somebody else is still up there. Another difference between us and, and a lot of folks, right? He left the father, came down here, father's still up there, and he says, this is the will of him who sent me that all he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. This bread of life that we eat is to give us eternal life, not that we're going to have an easy time of it today. This is the will of my father that everyone who beholds the son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. And the Jews were grumbling about him because he said, I'm the bread of life. Interesting, they were not grumbling about him saying that he was going to grant people eternal life, right? That seems to be a little more important, right? It seems to be, you know what I mean? A little bit more important. And so is this not Yeshua, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? Now, sometimes they say he's the father of Joseph. Other times they say what? They, they accuse Mary of adultery, right? And they say that he was Mary, that she was pregnant by somebody else. And he says, how does he say, I have come down from heaven? And he, he goes, don't grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the father, Except the one who is from God, he has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread which comes down out of heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I give will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Okay, we know now that's an analogy. Could you imagine standing there and hearing that? Okay. It is not unreasonable. Yeah, cannibalism. Yeah, not unreasonable for these people to be going, what? What did he just say? Nobody's ever said anything like this before. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Give us flesh to eat. That's... Against Torah. Yeah, yeah, cannibalism is definitely against Torah. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're probably gonna turn that down. 
Yeshua said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. My flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread which came down out of heaven, not as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. Yeah, he's pushing those people away right here. He's putting them to the test because the only way to keep walking with him at this point is blind faith. The only way that I could see, because I don't think he explained it. I don't think they understood it. He didn't die and get resurrected for a little bit long. Little, we got a few more chapters to go, right? That's, that's uh, chapter 19. So he said it in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. I thought this started with him standing in a field. Didn't this start with him standing in a field? No, yeah. Probably. Right. So they were um, confused. Many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? But Yeshua, conscious that his disciples grumbled at this, said to him, does this cause you to stumble? What then if you see the man, Son of Man ascending to where he was before? I'm going to tell you, if I put myself in their shoes, A, on the one hand, eat my flesh and you live. On the other hand, ascends back up into heaven. Option B, easier to believe. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, if he just said, send it, if he just, just, ascended back up into heaven and right that that would be an easier thing it's an easier lift right right eating his flesh what is he talking about it is the spirit who gives life the flesh profits nothing the words that i've spoken to you are spirit and are life remember when he first kind of started revealing himself to nicodemus in chapter three he tells Nicodemus, you have to be born again. He starts telling people things that are impossible to believe. Nicodemus is still there in the end. Nicodemus didn't understand it and kept saying, well, I don't understand that, but I understand all this other stuff that this guy is doing, this thing, all these things he's doing, he's saying, he's teaching. So they continue to believe him without fully understanding everything. That's our faith, too. There are things in the Bible that we don't understand, and we're not going to understand until he comes back and explains it to us. So we have to continue moving forward when we find parts of the Bible that seemingly contradict or seemingly are impossible or we don't quite understand. We also have to keep moving and keep believing and keep seeing, having patience that if it's important, he'll reveal it to us. Sooner or later, he wouldn't have said those words if they didn't matter, right? And that's what these guys do. They they weren't going to ditch him, but they were like, I don't get it. And it, it would it would make sense, too, to get in a little huddle up afterwards and go, okay, okay, Yeshua, we got you with the loaves and the fishes, walking on the water, okay? But eat the flesh thing. What, what are you talking about, right? What does that mean? That doesn't, that's not an unreasonable uh you know, question, but he still does it cause you to stumble. There are some of you who do not believe, for Yeshua knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe, even who it was that would betray him. And he was saying, For this reason, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted him from the Father. That is a little on the Calvinist side, that is a little bit on the predestination side, but he said it. So sometimes we get a little bit like, what? why is the world going the way it's going? Well, the Awi is clearly allowing it to happen. You know, the debauchery we saw yesterday. Go ahead, Everett. Yeah, before we get too far, um, that, that his words are spirit and his words are life. I think uh, that's true scattered throughout the scriptures. It's not just this one chapter. He sort of hinted at that. But I, I to me, uh, yeah, it, we won't all necessarily 
understand things when we read them with face value. You know, you've got to realize that more is going on in the background than what we understand. And it's throughout scripture. Yeah, I think I skipped that one on accident. I think I jumped over it. But yes, yes, it's the spirit who gives life. Ruach breathed into people. That's the Adam and Eve story. Spirit goes in, which animates. Same with Ezekiel 37. The spirit blows into all the people who are resurrected and they come back to life. The flesh profits nothing. Well, all a minute ago, you said if we ate your flesh, we were saved. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and now you're saying it profits nothing. What's going on? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and the words I've spoken to you are spirit in our life. Yeah, I agree totally that not just these words, right? You say it's all of them. Yeah. All right. Anybody else before I continue rambling? All right. Um. As a result, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. I believe that he pushed the people away. Remember, they were going to make him a king by force. He, After the food, after the food from heaven, they were going to take him and make him the king, which would have started a riot, which would have started the Roman demolishment, right? So... I think he was saying these hard things. Well, we know his words are purposeful. I think one motivation would to push them away, to kind of, he showed them what he wanted them to see, got them up to a point, and then, okay, now I'm going to tell you something that you can't accept. But then later, when he's resurrected and he appears to the 500, then things start clicking. Things that he said before start making sense. Because the apostles, the disciples just didn't, they didn't see it. They they were with him the whole time. They even, even early on, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Like John knew that Peter was given to Peter to know that he was the Messiah. They knew along the way, but they didn't get the, the death and the resurrection part until after that happened. And so I think he's he's using this to push these people away on purpose in order for them to to not miss the later big reveal. Does that make sense? I don't know. You guys are all giving me deer in the headlights looks. So <laughs> um Judas didn't go. Oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say um that Yeshua taught many are called but few are chosen. So I think um definitely God tests people um and yeah it's ultimately it's up to him and his will like who whoever is chosen and those are the people that he draws to himself yeah cool so Simon Peter says to whom shall we go you don't want to go away also, do you? You have you have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Yeshua answered, did I myself not choose you, the twelve, yet one of you is a devil? I mean, Peter's got to, got to have some self-esteem issues at some point, right? Peter's like, hey, man, I'm not going anywhere. Where would we go? And he gets, gets punched. The, the reply is one of you is a devil. Peter, you think he might be taking that personally? You know, I would have took it personally. Like, what? Huh? Devil? Right? <laughs> right? You know? Yeah, that's pretty harsh. But he met Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. Uh, he does call Peter Satan in what, at one point. <laughs> He's like, get behind me, Satan. He certainly does. Yeah. But Judas was... Was Judas already betraying him? Was he already mentally checked out? Yeah, what well, starts in the part nine? Yeah, but when? Because it looks it looks like it's already happening. How could Judas continue to witness these miracles and eat bread from heaven and see people resurrected and and still be like, I'm gonna betray him? Yep. 
just waiting for the right time. I mean, that's that's really bad. You know, that's really, really bad. If he's watches because he resurrects children, heals blind people, heals lame people, feeds people people schools the rabbis schools the scribes and he's just nothing but kindness and empathy and it, and then judas goes and betrays him that's really amazing at, at one point in time uh, didn't he tell peter that uh, satan has desired to sift you uh as wheat but i prayed for you that uh, your faith would hold up um, yeah. So I mean, maybe maybe that was a real possibility that uh, Peter Peter was kind of in the balance for a while. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Well, he was because he was a hothead for sure, and he's totally different after he gets the ruach on in Acts two, right? Up until then, he's he's trying to guess what the Messiah wants. He's trying to get ahead of him and try to figure him out. After he gets the Ruach, he's like, all right, this this Jesus, whom you guys crucified, whom God raised from the dead, or he's all in their face, like matter of fact. And then he goes and says the same thing to the Sanhedrin, knowing that the Sanhedrin were going to kill him for it. They just strung up Yeshua 50 days prior. And he's in there talking right to their faces. A uh, totally different guy, you know. I was just going to back him up that he had a spirit of Satan in him to do that to to turn him in, but also um, the devil lurks into around you wherever you're at, regardless of how close you are to the Father or Yeshua. He's still lurking and devour devouring the people, trying to get them away from uh, yeah. being saved or whatever. So and you just caused me to remember that it was it's later it's at the last supper where it says satan entered him so now we have a combination of free will and being controlled so it's because if judas is already thinking about it but he doesn't he doesn't read our minds but we allow him to enter our mind we allow him to to take over our whatever because he doesn't read the minds like god can but he, but we allow him to enter in from our sin or our weakness or whatever, what what's already in our hearts. Yeah, that's another um, thing. Is it's a lot of times we say you can see people writing that if it's good, it comes from God. If it's bad, it comes from Satan, and they leave us out of it. And we're we're you know all the thoughts of men were evil continually in Genesis six. It was men. It was people that, and that includes the women too, by the way, <laughs> not just the men, no blaming us. <laughs> uh, Yeshua actually called his own disciples evil. Um, in the verse where he says, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more does the father? Uh, was so that for the, uh, for them or for the, Let's find let's find that one. Uh, so Matthew seven, Luke eleven. Matthew seven and, and knock and who who's he talking to here? Yeah, he's talking for a long time. So is he is he he saw the crowd? So is he talking to the crowds? Verse eleven. Yeah, yeah. I'm reading it. No. Um like who is the you? Yeah, he's this is one long diatribe starts in five. Maybe if we go to and that's also do not judge or you be judged, but isn't that let me stay here? Nation? You do not judge, you will not be judged. Uh is for all of us. 
But we have to go to the next verse. For in the way you judge, you will be judged by your standard of measure, and it will be measured to you. So that way, he's, he's, he's really saying just to be patient and not hypocrites. That's And look at yourself yeah. before judging. Yeah. Yeah. Don't look at look at your spec. How do you see in your brother's eyes? You yeah, it seems to be talking to the public. Yeah. But maybe it's the other one. I'm going to use my cheats. Maybe not. Maybe I'll just go back to the other way. Search. It happened while Jesus was praying at a certain place. He said, when you, oh yeah, he's definitely talking to the disciples right here. Yep. Yeah. Point to Marson. Yep. <laughs> yeah. 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 You being evil. Whew. Yeah, I don't know. He did make it hard for people to stick around. But that's part of it. Any more on John 6? I was going to try to merge the two together, but the next chapter, it might be two, two weeks by itself. A lot of stuff in the next chapter. In uh, verse 57 of chapter 6, it says, As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. Uh, I've heard a number of people who say, well, uh, he lives because of the Father. That is, he was granted human life because of the Father. But when it's talking about the living Father, and you will live because of me, that's not talking about human life. So yeah. it, it seems to me that the, when he refers to himself as I live, that's talking about all aspects of life came from the Father. Son be saved. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Oh. If you have to go through, through the son to be saved to get to the father. So he's our he's our mediator. Yeah, he is the source. Yahweh is the source of all power, that's for sure. Yeah. Anybody? Visitors? <laughs> what would you say about Judas? You know. It says that you can't serve two masters. You can't serve money and you can't serve God himself. You know, Judas, he was the, the money handler and he sold him for 30 shekels, you know, of silver, you know. And so I'm pretty sure he was dipping into the money bag, you know, and he had a problem when the the perfume was being not being sold instead of being, being used to anoint Yeshua. So he i think his mind was more set on on money than it was on eternal life and salvation and the promises that he he brought forth so when you open up your mind to in your life to money as your most important thing you're welcoming in the evils of the world so he made himself a vessel for satan to enter him all right well the thirty shekels were for something else it was related to thirty shekels uh, the 30 shekels are very close to what they sold Joseph into slavery for. But not, not direct correlation, but very similar. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all of this about having to, uh, to eat Yeshua, um, it, because he, he is the word, and it reminds me of when he said that man does not live by bread alone but by every word that comes from the mouth of god so could that be what he's teaching here basically yeah that's a good one because that's isn't ezekiel who has to eat the tiny scroll and get indigestion right it's it's, it's sweet in his mouth but bitter at the same time right is that is that uh, i think so yeah ezekiel and john possibly and so that's that's it right you have to take his words and some of them are going to make you uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. Well, and also in Passover, when he says, eat this bread, drink this wine, for it resembles my blood shed, my body. Yeah. Yeah, that's what he's getting at, for sure. That's, it does, it does a little bit. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. 
it oh. seems to me as well, it, you know, there are people who we say live and breathe sports or their hobby or whatever it is that they do. And it, it seems to me that eating is something you do perpetually, need, you need to do to nourish yourself. Uh, do you want to just nourish your body or do you want to nourish your mind? That he's uh, in, encouraging us to uh, be anxious and diligent and and uh, forceful, I suppose, in some ways, to to dig in to his life and his teachings. Uh, it's not just something casual that you do every once in a while, but it, it's something that you you are uh, fully immersed in. You know, in uh, John 4, he talks that uh, I have food that you have no uh, knowledge of, that his food was to do the will of the Father. That was his focus in life. Yep. And this life passes away. And this life passes away. I was repeating uh so for that. And for um, you know, for me, this it's the I don't know factor. You know, there's a lot of stuff that we can study and find. And as we get into it, things make a lot more sense. But you know, he says you search the scriptures and you think that in them you find life, but they wrote of him. So yet it, it's kind of a double-edged thing. Yes, the scriptures have life in them because they talk about Yeshua. That's his life. But there's a lot of I don't knows. And, and there's a lot of times where we're just like, if we search for hidden meaning or we try to reconcile something and we just can't, then we, we have to be honest and say, I don't know. And uh, some people can't do that. I don't know. I, I don't, um, he may disclose it later. Yeah, he may disclose later, but... That, that's one of the big ones that I take away from it because that's, you know, when I got into this and we all got into this, we do think that we're going to figure it all out, right? We think we're going to get, right? You know, because look, using the Bible like a tech manual, we think we're going get, to get to everything, but there's a certain factor of, of things that, um, you know, the, the people whose names are not found written in the book of life. It means that there were people who were created that had never had a shot. That's a tough one, right? <laughs> right, and that's and and then you know how do you reconcile free will and and uh, salvation by alone? I mean, there's a a lot of things that we can get to the the volume of scripture say this, but then you also have to acknowledge, like like we were talking about dead people being dead earlier at the table, right? There are a couple places where you're like, it does look like they're not, you know. Like it does look like they're, you know, that they're floating around or they have some kind of consciousness. There are some verses that say that, but the preponderance and when they talk about the topic specifically, it's dead people are asleep, right? But every once in a while, like the Lazarus thing, right, where we try to dismiss that as a as as a vision or a parable or something, it's like, well. I don't know. <laughs> right. So, you you know, we have to make a, discer a judgment as to where we're going to come down. But there is a certain degree of I don't know to a lot of this. I don't know about a lot, but certain amount of I don't know that comes along. You guys think? Yeah. Not just me. I mean, we don't know. <laughs> All right. 